Okay, earth and heaven. Now, if this is familiar to some of you as we go through this, repetition is good, I think. But also, we have several new people, and so it's good for them to learn this also, and they need to pick it up, okay? Okay, Second Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible is God's COM, complete revelation from him to man. Nothing is missing. In other words, we don't need any new revelation. And when somebody says they got a revelation from God, that's called extra biblical revelation. Extra. And that's false. Because God doesn't speak to us that way. He speaks to us through his word today, doesn't he? Okay? By the way, that's the King James Bible. Thought I'd mention that. Okay? There are 66 books written by some 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. Each book fits together as a puzzle, becoming one. It's amazing that the dispensations fit in place with the exact way the books have been collected and their order, Genesis all the way through to Matthew, all the way through to Revelation. You know, the more you think about that, that's an amazing thing. Where you go from Genesis to the Israel's program, then you go to our program, flip, we go up in the rapture, then he resumes dealing with Israel. But it's amazing how the Bible puts those divisions together itself. Amazing story. The Bible, since the printing press, has traditionally been divided into two main segments. And by the way, I just put beside that, man-made. Remember, when the Bible was written, they didn't have chapters and all these things. Okay, man has done that. Okay? Most say, one, the Old Testament begins with Genesis and ends with Malachi. Malachi. They say the New Testament begins with Matthew. Matthew. And ends with Revelation. However, God has made divisions himself in his word. And when he, and he wants or expects us to study and recognize his divisions. Example, law and grace are different dispensations. As we see God's divisions we come to a point of decision. Will we believe and trust in man-made divisions or God's? That's what you have to come to. I remember I came to that point in my life later on in uh, the, my Christian walk, and I began to see it. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to follow what man says, or am I going to follow what the Bible itself says about itself? And when you make that decision, it's an, ama it's an amazing thing, the hate that you receive just for making that decision. We think the media is bad on this president, and it is. However, Christians can really be mean to other Christians, especially when they don't agree with you or they don't study it out anyway, a lot of them, <laughs> and they want to continue to put you down to make them seem right or bigger, whichever. Will we believe and trust men? men believe them? Okay, since most believe Genesis through Malachi is God's Old Testament, they believe the OT, Old Testament dealt mainly with Israel. They assume God's new dealings with us begin with Matthew, thus starting the New Testament. The Old Testament, up through Malachi, New Testament begins the book of Matthew. We will see this teaching is in most Bible colleges and seminaries, but it does not agree with the testimony of God's word itself. 
Again, 99% of Christendom believes the space between Malachi and Matthew is the dispensational dividing line that God placed in his word. You have the Old Testament, then you have a space, <laughs> then you have the New Testament. Okay? One, because of this thinking, Genesis through Malachi has to deal with time past, they say. Matthew then begins God's program for us today. Now that's most of Christendom. But the space between Malachi and Matthew is not there as a dividing line or a separation to tell us something has come to a close with the end of Malachi and something new, different, started with Matthew 1. Are you following me? Now here's the question. Why is this space... 400 years, there between Malachi and Matthew. Have you ever wondered why? Okay? The answer, this blank period of time stands for the prophesied period of silence. Silence in God's program dealing with Israel. Instead of saying the Old Testament... The o, or the OT, the old, is gone, and God is dealing in a new way, New Testament, instead of saying that, the truth is that the space between Malachi and Matthew links Malachi to Matthew. Malachi's and Matthew's Gospels are one and the same. They are not separate. That is confirmed by the fact that Malachi and Matthew were still under law. So if Malachi was under law and Matthew's under law, that tells you they're still under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, right? Does that make sense? Okay. This period of silence tells us that the Gospels, Matthew through John, which follow, do not bring in something so new. Both are still under law. The Old Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The thing that ends is the silence. But God continues his program and dealings with Israel when he said the kingdom is at hand, it's near. That was the new thing. The silence stopped. God was silent for 400 years, and then all of a sudden, he's no, that silence stopped. Notice in context that it's dealing with Israel's history. Israel had been in continued and persistent R.E. rebellion, idolatry. APO apostasy and ANTI anti God's word and ways. They had no or little spirituality. Now that's awful because they were supposed to be the nation that was supposed to be spiritual, right? So if you don't fight in Israel, more than likely you're not going to find it in the entire world. That's pretty sad, isn't it? God is holy, just, are responsible to carry out the penalties of the law. Since they're under law, they're under its rules, right? He sent judgment upon the Israelites by sending them into CAP captivity to the Assyrians, then the Chaldeans, and out of the land. The prophets from Isaiah to Malachi told the Jewish people that their CAP, captivity, was only the beginning. There also would be following chastisements to fall upon them. It was foretold by God's prophets that the final 
the final round of chastisements, this is up on Israel, would be in five installments. And you can find those five installments that go along with Israel's history in Leviticus 26 sometimes. Read that chapter. Okay? You can see it there. The fifth, the fifth one being the day of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord is the tribulation, right? Where God completely, in the trib, purges his nation and his remnant will be saved. That will happen over here during the seven years tribulation. That will be the final chastisement upon Israel where he purges the entire nation and he saves the little flock, the remnant, right here. Okay? Before this final judgment, there would be other judgments upon Israel. One would be an extended period of time when God would be silent, S-I-L-E-N-T, silent. That's one of the judgments on Israel. And say nothing to his nation. There would be no word from God. This meant that there would be no prophet, no prophet speaking for God to them. And by the way, they had the scriptures, a lot of them as they would go along, but he also spoke to and through his prophets to the nation of Israel, didn't he? And so he says, they're not going to hear from anybody. Okay? Amos says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, where it's underlined. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Okay? This silent period came, came upon Israel following, the Malachi, following Malachi the prophet. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi were the last prophets through whom God said, or God spoke to Israel before God went silent. So the last book in the Old Testament that we say, the Old Testament was of the prophets, was Malachi. The next one next to him is Zechariah. When I used to say, turn to the book of Zechariah, and everybody look at you. <laughs> Till finally I said, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 1. And they get to Matthew 1, and I said, now go two books to your left. <laughs> then they begin to catch up a little bit. A famine of hearing the words of the Lord. For 400 years, this silence was not broken by God until Luke 3, 2, where it's underlined, the word of God came unto John. The silence was broken when God spoke to John the Baptist. Amen? Okay? God had been silent for 400 years, and finally... There's a prophet he's going to speak through. John the Baptist began to function as God's prophet to Israel. Matthew 3:11. Uh, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's John the Baptist, right? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist, prepare ye the way of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Christ. Okay? How many of you follow that? Okay, that's pretty good. Three, so the silence between Malachi and Matthew stands for the silence of God to Israel, which was prophesied by Amos. We just read Amos. This was maintained for 400 years until John the Baptist. 
this space between Malachi and Matthew is not a dividing line from the Old Testament to New Testament covenant. From the time God called out Abram in Genesis what? 12. That's when Abram's called. Making his covenant with Abram and his seed to the time of Paul. God's program dealt with Israel. In other words, from Genesis until God raises up Paul, that previous time, God's dealing with the nation of Israel. From Genesis 12 all the way through till Acts 9, God raises up Paul. He's dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, why is that important? My, why is that important to know that? It would help us to not try to find our doctrine, that's for today, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like most people do. That's very, very important, Okay? Okay, let me find where I am here. Huh? F1. Making his covenant with Abraham his seed. At that moment also, the Gentiles were put into a position when Abraham was called, okay, of alienation from God as he drew closer to Israel and EX exclusively to Israel. Israel became God's favored nation. So you have from Genesis 12 all the way to Acts, Israel's favored until this dispensation we're in is completed, then he deals with Israel once again. Okay? That makes sense? Uh, you notice on the bottom of that page, I put Genesis 3, 6, 10, 11. Remember that prior to Genesis 12, who were the people? They were Gentiles. So Adam and Eve failed, then the world failed, and he had to destroy the world by a flood, right? Right? And then in Genesis 10 and 11, what happened? Tower of Abel. So the Gentiles already demonstrated that they didn't want this God. So sometimes when we say Israel's the favored nation, people say, why are they favored over us? Well, we as Gentiles completely failed God and didn't want God. And so God says, okay, I'm just going to raise me up a nation who will love me. I'm going to favor them. Why should I favor you? All you've done is turn your back on me and go toward idolatry. Hello? Okay? Okay. Page 3. And here we are as Gentiles. You being, in, where it's underlined, you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, that at that time you were without Christ. Strangers from the covenants of promise. No hope without God. We Gentiles had no covenants, no God, no hope. During the Old Testament, Genesis 12, the four Gospels, and early Acts. This is why Paul says in Romans 8, 15, 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision when Christ was on earth. Who did Christ minister to? The nation of Israel. Not us. The nation of Israel. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, Christ told him. Remember that? And notice this, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Gentiles had none of those covenants. Galatians 4, God sent forth his son, made under the law. When Christ was on earth, he was under the law, ministering to the nation of Israel who were under law. 
not the body of Christ. We're not under law. Right? Okay? During Genesis through Acts 8, Genesis all the way through up to Acts 8, it shows God working in time past in dealing with Israel. And let me just say that there, a Gentile could be saved, but he had to go through Israel. Okay? And that didn't happen a whole lot. Today's Dispensation of Grace program was not ushered in until God temporarily set Israel aside. When Act 7 happened, God began with Paul. Acts 9. A new, different dispensation called the mystery of Christ. God had a secret that had been hidden the body of Christ. You know, Paul's the only one who mentions the body of Christ. He's the, the other, all the other writers of the Bible never mentions the body of Christ. Only Paul does. Because that was a hidden thing. Number one, to be a new program, God raised up a new apostle to take the lead. Saul, who became Paul. With Paul, the Gentiles were no longer... The outsiders. When Israel was a favored nation, we were outside. We were on the other side of the wall of partition, as they say. But today, that's not the case. Genesis, the first part, there's neither Greek, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There are no favored statuses today. Nobody's favored today. We're all sinners. <laughs> we all come to faith in Christ the same way. We don't have certain privileges as Israel had. And by the way, let me say, Israel's not favored today. Two, so with this great dispensational change from law to grace, it is vital that we rightly divide. This means when we handle the Bible, we recognize God's divisions because they are God's divisions. That's the important thing. Not man-made divisions, but God's divisions he shows in the Word himself. Okay? Now, notice your following charts here. Uh, some of you have these, but few of you don't. Now, just look at that first one there. There's your dispensations right there. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, and Acts 9, Paul, church, that's us today. That's where we are today. One day we'll go up in a rapture. There, that little red part, that seven years tribulation, Christ comes at the end of that tribulation and he judges the nations and so on and sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. Okay, notice the next one. <laughs> I like this one. You are here. <laughs> time passed, what God did from Genesis through mid-Acts, time passed with the nation of Israel. Present, what God is doing today with the body of Christ, the but now, Romans through Philemon. And the future, after we're raptured up, God, he deals once again with the nation of Israel. See that? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Okay. Does that mean we don't study those other books, by the way? No. They still have the Spirit of God on them. Matter of fact, we're looking tonight at more of the past than we are in Pauline truth, aren't we? Huh? We love the rest of Scripture. There's a spirit of truth. I'm looking at one where... Uh, under law, but there's a spirit about what the principle of that truth is, is that men were not to wear women's clothing. Huh? And there's a spirit about that, a principle of truth that we should follow today. Today we're feminizing men. 
rather than having men, you know, they get upset with men for looking at attractive women. We're men. Hello? We're aggressors. Now, I'm not saying you don't lust and stare at them and think things. I'm not talking about it, but you see somebody, you can say, good job, God, amen, and going about your business. <laughs> amen? <laughs> okay, top page six. But they don't want you to be a man today. By the way, if they don't want man making advancements, down put some clothes on. Forgive me. Okay, now notice. This is important to know to help prevent the misuse. To help prevent the misuse of God's Word. All of the Bible is for our learning and admonition, but it is Paul's epistle that are EX exclusively to us and about us. Like I said, we can use the Old Testament, the Spirit. There are many godly spiritual principles that we can use for today. There's nothing wrong with that. But as far as our doctrine and what he's teaching us, that the way we are to live today, we find in Paul's epistles. Uh, let me see here. Paul's epistles are where we find our doctrine, instructions, promises, and heavenly hope. What did eternal life mean to the Jews? What did it mean to the Jews? Paradise, kingdom on the earth. What does eternal life mean to us? We'll be going over the universe, I believe. Huh? Quite a difference, isn't it? Question, when and where did the Old Testament begin? Now, let me just say, if you're new, <laughs> this guy blows your mind, because the first time I heard it, I said, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Until I got my dispensations down correctly, then I said, well, that makes sense. So if this is new to you, study it out. To study it out, okay? The answer is, in God's intention, okay, it'd be Genesis 12. That's when he called out Abraham, right? In planning, in planning, Exodus, Moses says this here, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation who's he talking there to and right and he's going to give them the old testament the old covenant the law to the people of Israel now notice Technically, the actual inauguration of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, took place when there was provided a death and shedding of blood. You can read that Exodus sometime. Just look where it's underlined. And said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, that's the Old Testament, blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made, with you concerning all these words. And he made a covenant with the nation of Israel there. That's the Old Testament, the Old Covenant that was enacted when they shed blood. There was a death and they shed blood. That's when it actually took place. Okay? Question. When was the Old Testament covenant law terminated? Well, Colossians, blotting out the handwriting. What's the handwriting? The Old Testament and the law, okay? Notice where it's under, or, I'm sorry, of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of, of the way, nailing it to his, what? Cross. Romans six fourteen. Paul says about us, where it's underlined, for you are not under law, but under grace. The abolishing of the Old Testament covenant law 
took place the day Christ died. All during the time of the four Gospels and early Acts, they were under the old, they, I'm sorry, they were under the old covenant up until the time of Christ, excuse me, until the time of Christ, and he died on the cross. But even after that, they were still under the law because they did not understand what was going on in some areas. I'll, I'll share that in a minute. But it's at the cross that it actually terminated. Okay? But the reason they don't do it in early Acts is because God is giving Israel a new chance, opportunity to believe that Jesus is the Christ Messiah. Even after the rapture, they go into the kingdom here, the thousand year promise and so on, you'll see the law will be reenacted because Christ will have the Spirit of God living in them and causing them to follow and obey that law from their hearts. Huh? Interesting. Okay, where am I here? Three. Question, when did the New Testament begin? Matthew 1.1? 1, 1? No, 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 no. Okay? The New Testament, the New Covenant, okay? Scripturally, the New Testament did not begin in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, but only when there was the final death, sacrifice, and blood, Christ. Okay? Luke there, he says, where it's underlined, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you, referring to his work that he's going to accomplish on the cross. That's when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament that's when it actually begun. Isn't that interesting? Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> Can I help you? <laughs> the beginning of the New Testament covenant was foretold. Foretold by the prophets. Jeremiah, where it's underlined. Behold, the days come that I will make a New covenant with who? The house of Israel. After those days, and that's talking about the tribulation. The Old Testament, a covenant that lasted 1,500 years, made with the nation of Israel. It lasted from Moses to the cross. The New Testament, a new covenant that is part of Israel's future, 1,000 years, the kingdom, the millennial, made with Israel only. You doing okay? Is this too deep? Too hard? Question, if the Old Testament, New Testament were made with Israel, the Old Covenant, New Covenant, then this could not possibly be the major division in God's word for us. Think that through now. So where do believers today fit in? Where is God's major division? The answer is Israel's prophecy... That's Genesis through Acts 8 there. And then mystery body. That's the, the division you need to understand. The Old Testament and even the New Testament, but it has dealing with Israel. The mystery body of Christ has to deal with us. So when you're talking about prophecy, you're talking about Israel, you're talking about mystery, you're talking about us, the body of Christ. Prophecy, 
Israel, mystery, us. There's the division of the Bible. You look at the Bible prophetically through Israel, the mystery body of Christ for us today. That's the division that you need to try to get a hold of so you can interpret the scriptures correctly. Okay? Now, today, the most important division in the Bible is the one between prophecy and the great mystery program proclaimed by Paul. Interesting, Genesis 1, in the beginning, the first verse, God created the heaven and the earth. Isn't that amazing? He already had two programs that he had in mind, one on earth and one in heaven, unbeknownst to anybody. God has always had a purpose concerning the earth quite distinct, quite distinct from his purpose for heaven. Paul says it this way. that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Let me just say something to you. The fullness of times is a dispensation. That's what he says there. And it doesn't take place until over here. You have innocent, conscience, government, promise and law with Israel, us today, grace, the ages to come, dealing with these in the thousand-year reign, the, and... Uh, the white throne, and then the fullness of times comes over here. Now notice what he says about the fullness of times. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both. Before it, it wasn't. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Colossians says it this way, where it's underlined, heaven, earth, that which is visible would be what? The earth, you can see it. That which is invisible is what? Heaven. Okay? The first one is, number three, the earth. The earth. Christ will reign with Israel, a thousand years, in the earthly kingdom. This is the fulfillment of Israel's prophecy program. Just where it's underlined, and he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. Now get this. Which have been since the world began. In other words, it was known. The prophets foretold about this coming kingdom this millennial kingdom here, this thousand years. Prophets, the prophets foretold that. The Israelites had the scriptures, and they knew, they knew this was to take place. It was known. It wasn't something hiding, was it? And you can look at these verses, Acts 2 there. Let me see. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. When? For how long? Since the world began. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that will follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. They spoke the things concerning Israel, its prophecy, its coming kingdom, Christ reigning, and so on. It was known. But then notice, for the heaven. The heaven. The body of Christ has a heavenly calling or hope. Interestingly, there is not one word about us found in Israel's prophecy program. Hello? Now think that through now. Through all the prophets that they made known about all the future that's going to take place and everything, 
They told about it, but there's nothing about this program right here, the mystery program, the new dispensation, the body of Christ that we are in today. You don't find it anywhere. Isn't that amazing? To me, I mean, it's just amazing. So Flo Arthur gets mad at me all the time because over here it says I go to prepare a place for you, your mansion. And I keep over here taking away her mansion. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Kenny got her a house trailer, he said. Okay. There's not one word about us found in Israel's prophecy program. And by the way, if there's not one word about us, why in the world are we going back here trying to get that for us? Now, once again, there's spiritual principles we can use. I understand that. But not specifically to us. Okay. Our going to heaven is God's secret, hidden, H-I-D-D-E-N, hidden program of the mystery. It was unknown. God kept us the mystery body of Christ secret until he was ready to bring the body into being, beginning with Paul. Now just notice Paul's talking about my gospel, the revelation of the mystery. You see that in that Romans 16? The revelation of the mystery, which was what? Kept secret for how long? Since the world began. Wait a minute. Israel, they've been speaking about it since the beginning of the world. But the body of Christ, Paul says, nobody knew about the body of Christ since the world. Nobody spoke about it until Paul, it was revealed to Paul. That means I, as a member of the body of Christ, could not be back here. I have to be here. And it was a guarded secret. Why was it a secret, by the way? Why was it kept a secret? Exactly. Very good, Rhonda. If they'd known uh, about the body of Christ and all that it would accomplish, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. Also, remember in early Acts, there is an offer of the kingdom. And it would be under the new covenant. Remember, the new covenant could not begin until the old covenant was done away. And both of them took the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then they offered the kingdom. God in his foreknowledge knew that Israel would say no. Now remember, Israel's the favored nation. She's the one who's supposed to share the truth with the world. Israel first and the world. So if Israel doesn't believe... There's nobody to share the truth to the world. So God kept us secret until this was completed, and he temporarily sets them aside. He will deal with them over here after we're gone. But this here was keep, kept secret, so this would be a legitimate kingdom offer to the people of Israel. Huh? Somebody said, well, what if they would have believed? Well, God knew they wouldn't. But God said in his mind and his heart for some reason, I have a secret plan that I'm going to introduce when Israel rejects me again. They rejected the Father, they rejected the Son, and now they reject the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to have this group of people here saved by grace because Israel has failed and there's nobody to tell them. And he raises up Paul. Isn't that great? That's good stuff, people. I wish somebody would have told me that my first year I was saved. It saved me a lot of trouble. Twisting those scriptures to make them fit me was really difficult. <laughs> now notice what I say there. Uh, secret and so on. Uh, Romans, okay. The, last, the next page here, page 8. I'm about done. 2 Corinthians. 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What was the wisdom of God that was kept secret? Israel is going to be set aside, and God's going to bring up a new entity called the body of Christ. You remember the Jews, when Paul would preach and tell Peter and all that? It was hard for them. They've been God's favored people for 1,500 years. And then all of a sudden, they're not. Can you imagine how hard that was when Paul says, You're gonna, your promises, your covenant's going to be delayed for a while. God's doing a new thing right here. He's raising up whoever you are, Jew or Gentile, saved by the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was hard for the Jews to comprehend that. Even the hidden wisdom, Ephesians a three, which in other ages was not made known to make all men see what the fellowship of, of the mystery hath been hid in God. Colossians 1.26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now through Paul is made manifest to his saints. There is a vast difference between prophecy that was spoken by the mouth of all God's holy prophets since the world began and that which was kept secret since the world began. You and I were kept secret since the world began until Paul got on the scene when God saved him in Acts 9. Okay, anybody want to shout right now? Just say, whoo, 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 something. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Uh, what we studied tonight is important, and it just helps in a lot of areas. Uh, if it's new to some people, I just pray that they would consider it and study their own Bible and uh, come up to their conclusion of what they believe your divisions actually say. And I hope that would be a real help. It's helped us who comprehend it and uh, to not be hoodwinked. Uh, to know uh, exactly who he's talking to, what he's talking about, when, why, where, what, all those things are answered. And uh, just thank you that we live in the dispensation of grace. Uh, we live in the mystery program age that you revealed to your new apostle by the name of Paul. And uh, I just am so grateful that I've learned this before you take me home so I can share it with as many people as we possibly can, that it just uh, uh, fits. We have phone calls, we have letters that come in, that people are just thrilled the fact that they know they can go somewhere that teaches this. And it's a blessing to them, and we're grateful for that, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You have a safe night.